Hello, and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. When you're ready to build your next pipeline or want to test out the projects you hear about on the show, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so check out our friends at Linode. With their new managed database service, you can launch a production-ready MySQL, Postgres, or MongoDB cluster in minutes with automated backups, 40 gigabit connections from your application hosts, and high-throughput SSDs. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash Linode today and get a $100 credit to launch a database, create a Kubernetes cluster, or take advantage of all of their other services. And don't forget to thank them for their continued support of this show. Modern data teams are dealing with a lot of complexity in their data pipelines and analytical code. Monitoring data quality, tracing incidents, and testing changes can be daunting and often takes hours to days or even weeks. By the time errors have made their way into production, it's often too late and the damage is done. Datafold built automated regression testing to help data and analytics engineers deal with data quality in their pull requests. Datafold shows how a change in SQL code affects your data, both on a statistical level and down to individual rows and values before it gets merged to production. No more shipping and praying. You can now know exactly what will change in your database. Datafold integrates with all major data warehouses, as well as frameworks such as Airflow and DBT, and seamlessly plugs into CI workflows. Visit dataengineeringpodcast.com slash datafold today to book a demo with Datafold. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Nandam Kartik about his experiences building analytics projects with DBT and Optimus for his clients at Sigmoid. So Nandam, can you start by introducing yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm working as a senior engineering manager at Sigmoid. And I have been working in the data space for close to four years. And prior to that, I worked in a few gaming companies and also in B2B products. Uh, And do you remember how you first got started working in data? Yeah. So this happened about four years ago. At the time, my experience has been on the product. Around that time, I was working in two data like gaming companies. I've also been working as a full stack in a company, taking care of a couple of products end to end. So I have had the opportunity to work with a business manager, trying to understand the business requirement for the product, and then take care of the end to end life cycle of delivering on that, like right from adding new features, deploying them to production, fixing live issues that were there on the game, and also improving performance. So that gave me a flavor of you know what it feels like to work on complete product end to end. So when this opportunity came, there are a couple of things that really excited me. So one is of course the big data domain, which was new at the time. That was one, and the other is the opportunity to lead projects end to end. So because I had a flavor of how it is when you work on projects end to end, so the scale that I understood when I work on these projects is much bigger. So that those are the two reasons why you know I got you know interested in the role, and that's how I got you know landed in the data. And in terms of the work that you're doing at Sigmoid, can you give a bit of background about what the company is and some of the types of projects that you're involved in? So Sigmoid is a data engineering and analytics company. It started off as a product company building an analytics product engine and also a front-end for it, and slowly evolved into a consulting company as well. So currently, we take up analytics projects. We work on providing, building custom solutions based on the client requirements. So the requirements would be from the data space. So any kind of data kind of project, we kind of like understand the problem and build custom solution. A few examples are, Cloud migration. So when there are some customers who are on-prem and want to migrate to cloud, so that is one type of projects that we have. We also work on MLOps kind of projects. We have also worked on developing data models and productionizing them. We have also ETL pipelines end-to-end and also worked on governance. So different areas like in the data space. When you start to engage with some of the different clients that you work with, I'm wondering what are some of the core challenges that they're facing when they reach out to you and if there's any sort of commonality in terms of the stage of their kind of data maturity or particular industries or geographies that you tend to work with? We we serve mostly North America. We have also 
work with companies in South America and a few in Europe, and of course in India as well. So we have clients from everywhere in the world. In terms of the reasons why you know clients come to us is the kind of clients that come to us. Some of them are early in their data journey where they are trying to look for an expert to come in, understand the problem, and build the foundation to building their data lake. And so that down the line, a lot of analytics and uh, intelligence, like uh, AI projects can be built on top of it. Some clients have already enough maturity. They have, they're already somewhere in the journey and they're, they're looking for experts like us to come in, take up, understand the problem and deliver it quick and, you know, with the best quality. So, so it's kind of like some little bit, you know, early in the journey where we, you know, help them a lot in terms of building it. And some clients, we offer the data engineering expertise in building solutions. For the conversation today, we're focusing on some of your experience of working with these clients to build out different DBT projects and then using another utility called Optimus to be able to handle the orchestration of that workflow. And in general, the overall paradigm of extract, load, transform with DBT being the transformation step has become fairly widespread and widely adopted, particularly for analytics-focused projects. And I'm wondering if you can give some examples of the types of projects that you've built with this approach and some of the types of analytics or types of questions that customers are trying to address when they engage with you and when you're working with them. Talk about one of the projects where I have used uh, DBT. The company was into mining and they have different mining sites located across the world. And at the mining sites, they have a lot of equipment and there are a lot of sensors on them, which generate events, which get collected by a system. And those events are used to kind of like understand any kind of issues thing on the site to monitor the performance of the various equipment, efficiency and all. And there was an existing Excel-based reporting that used to happen at every site. And what when we started on this project, what we wanted to do is to make that whole process more end-to-end automated and also add more best practices on top of it. Because the reports are site-specific. So there are reports, Excel-based reports, and they are very specific to site. So there are about like 10 to 12 sites, each site having their own uh, site-specific format and logic for the report. And it is also created frequently, uh, every few weeks, manually as well. So that also introduces the you know error part, human error part into it. When we picked up this project, so that was the state of how the reporting was done. And, and we wanted to standardize. Number one, we wanted to automate the whole reporting and also introduce the visual layer. So because these are all Excel-based tabular reports, like bringing in the visual aspect to it gives a lot more you know, understanding of the data as well. Right? It brings in a new perspective. So one was to automate and the other was to visualize the data. And third was to create some global reports as well. So which are more at a global level. So somebody who is sitting and wants to look at all the sites data. So that would basically be the global reports. So these are the three requirements that we had. And the events data that we were using was coming into BigQuery on Google Cloud Platform as a raw data. And we have used DBT to write SQLs, which would process that data and generate tables back to BigQuery again, which are then queried to visualize the performance of basically like calculate different KPI metrics, which would help in analyzing the performance of the site equipment. As far as the overall kind of patterns or structures or project architecture that you work through, I'm wondering if there are any kind of core practices that you use as a basis across the board. And as you work with different customers, what are some of the types of changes or types of customizations that you have to add in as the particular requirements become bespoke for a given organization or use case? So in this particular project that I just explained, that we were using DPT, we were using it to 
perform like transformations where we already have the data in BigQuery. So some of the patterns are how we have used TBT and also trigger these jobs on a daily basis, etc. This we have achieved by dockerizing, dockerizing the code and running it on Google Cloud Engine, uh, Google Kubernetes. And the way we were triggering them was based on schedule. So the tables that I was talking about, which was used in reporting, new data gets received every hour and we run these jobs every hour. So we have a schedule-based trigger and based on the schedule, an event gets generated. And this event is something that a process that is running as a daemon in the Kubernetes cluster picks up this event and based on the message that is there in the event, it recognizes which flow to kind of like trigger. So accordingly, we kind of run the dbt command with some parameters which would trigger a specific flow. So the pattern here is dbt is mainly used for transformation, write SQL and transform, create a job. And then we kind of like use other services on the cloud platform, listen to any triggers. The trigger here is schedule. Based on the schedule, we have a mechanism you know, to uh, you know, parse the event and trigger. And once the event completes again, we have a notification which can then trigger another job. For the dbt code, I'm wondering, as you start to work with these different customers and get them kind of up to speed on the workflow of writing dbt and building with it, what are some of the, I guess, sharp edges or white spaces in the dbt utility itself that you start to encounter and some of the ways that you've had to address some of the issues or shortcomings as you work through? So I have been using dbt and dbt as a tool is also evolving. For a version of dbt, there may be some features that are not present, which may be required in a project. I've encountered one issue that I will talk about. So in this project that I was talking about, so dbt works very well when you have a very simple you know, requirements or simple inputs to the pipeline to run. Like if you want, so dbt allows you to, so when you run dbt command, it runs for all the tables that you have as a target. Now you can, of course, choose a specific table as a target. So you can call dbt run and then the specific table name. But when you have a more complex requirements, like if you want to trigger the dbt pipeline based on some inputs like start date, end date, and some kind of Boolean parameters, then it won't support. So for some versions of dbt. So at the time when I was using dbt, this feature was not available. So I had to compromise on that feature. And this requirement of passing start date and date or any other user variables to the dbt command will be required based on your requirement. So for example, typically when we run the pipeline, we run for previous day as an example. We get the data for previous day and we run dbt to process the data. Whenever there are any data corrections that are happening to older data, in order to fix it, you will have to run the pipeline again for the entire duration or the window of data where you have bad data, which is corrected. Now, in order to fix it, we'll have to run the pipeline again. And if you don't have these kind of additional capabilities built in, like where you can specify a start date and end date, right? If the issue was with data for the last 10 days, Right. If you don't have this capability feature, then you'll have to run dbt like 10 times. In fact, that may also not work depending on how you have configured your dbt pipeline. But having this feature of providing start date and end date, where start date can be like 10 days before and end date can be like yesterday. So you can at once run for all the previous 10 days and fix the data. So when you want advanced capabilities and advanced features on your pipeline, dbt may not support encountered this with a version of dbt at the time and this feature was available in the future releases so things to kind of like look out for is whenever we are using this tool we need to understand the use cases that we are looking at and the capabilities that we're looking at and evaluate the latest version of dbt to see that all the capabilities that you are looking to use are offered by dbt latest version if not then those are some of the features that you'll have to compromise Rudderstack helps you build a customer data platform on your warehouse or data lake. 
Instead of trapping data in a black box, they enable you to easily collect customer data from the entire stack and build an identity graph on your warehouse, giving you full visibility and control. Their SDKs make event streaming from any app or website easy, and their extensive library of integrations enables you to automatically send data to hundreds of downstream tools. Sign up for free today at dataengineeringpodcast.com slash rudder. In order to handle the orchestration of some of these projects, I know that you're using a utility called Optimus. I'm wondering if you can give a bit of overview about what that project is and some of the story behind that and the role that it plays in this DBT workflow. So Optimus is more of a wrapper on top of Airflow. It is a custom tool built on top of Airflow. Uh, It is more of an orchestration tool where typically when you want to build any kind of pipelines, or jobs. We use Airflow connectors to build them. Now, Optimus as a wrapper on top of Airflow kind of like makes it easier and makes it configuration driven. So as an example, this particular project that I was involved. So Optimus is built based on this concept of configuration driven jobs. And when you compile this, it translates into Airflow DAX, which get deployed in Airflow server. So The biggest advantage of a tool like this is it makes it easy, not just for engineers to build orchestration tools and set up the jobs because it is configuration driven. And most of the jobs that we typically deal with are moving data from a table to another table. So once we have the raw data from storage, like in case of Google, so the data is in Google Cloud Storage. So once you load the data into a raw BigQuery table, from there onwards, all the transformation happens on BigQuery from table to table. So majority of the transformation logic is done through S12. Now, with tools like Optimus, which provide a plugin like BQ to BQ, it makes it configuration driven. So you will have to specify a BigQuery table as a source, and you'll have to specify a target table as your destination or target. and you write your S12. So you don't have to worry about what is Airflow, what is DAG, how to write an Airflow DAG, how to do the deployment. So it basically you know, makes it very easy and increases the you know, kinds of skill set people that can create jobs, production ready jobs. It's not just for data engineers, it is also enabling data analysts and other you know, experienced people to also write the jobs. As far as the implementation, I'm wondering if you can talk to some of the design of the Optimus tool itself and some of the ways that you thought about how to design the interfaces to allow for more of these roles to be able to interact with the orchestration layer so that you don't have to get data engineers involved every time you want to add a new scheduled DBT run. Typically, when we don't have tools like Optimus, and if you want to productionize any kind of job like NestQuill that may come from an analyst, etc. As a data engineer, you will have to figure out all the dependencies for the job and you know create airflow DAGs and deploy them. With tools like Optimus, a lot of it is taken care of. So there is a particular pattern that we follow in terms of how we name the tables, etc. And when I define a job, Optimus underneath is able to identify the dependent tables automatically. And based on the automatic detection of dependencies, uh, it creates an airflow tag when we compile this code. So this again is the intelligence when you follow the patterns of Optimus and when you write a job, it automatically figures out the dependencies and deploys the airflow tags in airflow. Again, this design automates a lot of the you know engineering specific workloads right and allows to define the job based on config so in addition to this job so there are of course a lot of CACD steps so whenever we have any optimal job written there are of course a lot of test cases that run and also converting the optimus config jobs into airflow tag happens behind the scenes when we deploy the solution to production where compilation happens and Airflow DAGs. The whole of Optimus code is compiled, and again, Airflow DAGs are generated. Those DAGs are used to refresh the Airflow server. 
As far as the kind of tactical and organizational practices that you build up and encourage your clients to use as you're working through the implementation of these DBT projects, I'm wondering if you can describe some of the ways that that combination of DBT and Optimus influences the ways that you think about how to structure the teams and structure the work that's being done. Recently, there is a trend where you know a lot of customers or a lot of clients, a lot of organizations are using data warehouse tools quite a lot. And this is primarily because most of these warehousing tools are becoming very capable and performant. So three to four years ago, you know, these tools were not that popular and capable. And there were other technologies that were, you know, doing the job. And recently these tools are becoming more and more mature. We have Snowflake, which separates storage and compute. Right. So because these tools are becoming more performant and we are seeing a good adoption by organizations, SQL is becoming more of a popular, you know, scripting language to you know, write transformations. So it basically is enabling a lot of data analysts to write analytic-based queries and easily you know, productionize them as well. With data warehousing tools becoming more and more performant and capable, most of the organizations recently are moving towards using them more, and SQL is becoming more uh, predominant. Now, with tools like dbt, which makes the SQL code more modular and also follow the software lifecycle. It is very easy to write the code, which is production ready. So prior to this, prior to this kind of technology and then the tools, when we want to productionize something, there is a collaboration between different teams like business analysts and data engineers or data scientists where information exchange happens. That is a lot of knowledge transfer happens and data engineers were responsible to production as a code. With data warehousing tools becoming more popular and tools like dbt and Optimus filling a lot of the automations and creating a lot of these wrappers on top of typical tools, it is becoming very easy to write the production-ready code at once. So definitely there is a huge benefit in using this technology and this way of you know, developing pipelines. So this is some of the trends that I'm seeing in the organizations. For teams who are building with dbt, I'm wondering what you have found to be some of the useful kind of heuristics or strategies for understanding when dbt is the right set of tools to use to solve a particular analytical challenge and when you need to go a different route where maybe you need some more kind of custom coding or custom development or more complex transformations or pipelines to be able to achieve a particular outcome. When we have a typical transformation like uh, simple to complex, which can be solved using SQL. We can do it with dbt. And when you have advanced processing requirements or advanced techniques to be applied, where we have to use a different technology like Python or PySpark, so that's where dbt does not help. So normal data processing is something that we can do, but on top of it, if you want to run any kind of like Python code or any kind of like Spark code, etc., you'll have to like you know move away from dbt, right? So works very well when you are doing SQL-based transformations. You can use dbt to make the code more manageable and write once and easily productionize it. But when you have more advanced requirements and more complex requirements for processing data, enriching data, applying more AI technologies, dbt does not help there. Optimus, as I said, is more of an orchestration wrapper. We can create new plugins. So we have plugins to load the data from storage to BigQuery, transform the data from BigQuery table to BigQuery. We can even export the data from a BigQuery table to back to file system or even cloud storage. So since this is written on top of Airflow, based on the organization requirement, we can create plugins. And the advantage is you're creating the plugin once and it is configuration driven. So you're not repeating the same work again and again. You're creating a plugin, you just reuse it, and it's easy to kind of like, again, reuse what is there and then quickly develop things and productionize.
data teams are increasingly under pressure to deliver. According to a recent survey by Ascend.io, 95% reported being at or over capacity, with 72% of data experts reporting demands on their team going up faster than they can hire, it's no surprise they are increasingly turning to automation. In fact, while only 3.5% report having current investments in automation, 85% of data teams plan on investing in automation in the next 12 months. That's where our friends at Ascend.io come in. The Ascend Data Automation Cloud provides a unified platform for data ingestion, transformation, orchestration, and observability. Ascend users love its declarative pipelines, powerful SDK, elegant UI, and extensible plugin architecture, as well as its support for Python, SQL, Scala, and Java. Ascend automates workloads on Snowflake, Databricks, BigQuery, and open source Spark, and can be deployed in AWS, Azure, or GCP. Go to dataengineeringpodcast.com slash ascend and sign up for a free trial. If you're a data engineering podcast listener, you get credits worth $5,000 when you become a customer. In terms of the applications of this combination of DBT and Optimus and some of the types of projects that it's enabled you to do or some of the ways that it has empowered some of the different organizations that you've worked with, I'm wondering what are some of the most interesting or innovative or unexpected ways that you've seen them applied? So DBT in one of the projects, I'll give you a little bit of background about the project. It's a product with a UI where investors who want to invest in companies would want to visit your website to kind of like understand about different companies, right? So you, you may want to, as an investor, you may want to compare an organization, like understand about the organization, understand about the revenue, and then, you know, how the what kind of skill set people you have in the organization, how the company has grown over the years. So you wanted to understand about a company. And in addition, you also want to compare two or three organizations side by side and trying to compare the revenues, skill set, or different things. So to build this product, so we have used TBT in a slightly interesting way. So to bring the data about the organization so that we can provide all of this information to the end user, we have been taking the LinkedIn data and that LinkedIn data is uh, processed and stored into different Snowflake tables. You have a jobs table, you have a revenue table, you also have you know uh, employee table, you also have the history of the employee. Table. So all of the different entities, data that can come out of LinkedIn was all created from the raw data, stored it in the Snowflake tables. So to do this transformation and processing, we have used TBT. That's one. And whenever a user who is typically an investor who comes to the website, logs in, and then is searching for a company, right? And whenever a user triggers from the UI to query about a company, the request in the backend is also automated using Airflow and using DBT. And here the flow would basically query all the entities that were recently refreshed with the latest data from LinkedIn. And user-specific tables are populated using the source uh, base tables. So this flow is also done using DBT. So one is to refresh the data every week from LinkedIn is one to keep the data latest. And based on the user commands or triggers from the UI, again, we have orchestrated the generation of data specific to the user requirement using Airflow and DPT and populating the user specific tables. So this is one of the ways that we have used DPT. It's not just for ETL. We have also used DPT to serve user requests as well from the website. It's, of course, not very quick. It takes a few minutes for the request to be served. But here in this case, that wait time is acceptable. And as you have been working with your customers and working with DBT some more, I'm curious if there are any strategies or approaches to how to think about structuring DBT projects or ways to kind of manage some of the iteration or specific configuration approaches that have been most useful for being able to maybe optimize build times or reduce error rates or introduce useful tests as you iterate on these projects? So in the DBT project that I have worked on, so we have a project template. So we have created a template for DBT project. If we need to spin off a new project using DBT, we already have the boiler template. 
with how to use it. And that is one pattern that we have seen that we have used successfully. The other is also DBT allows you to write test cases. So this also helps in any time there is a coaching. DBT also allows us to write test cases and run them as part of the CSED. So this again helps in quickly iterating on any improvements that you're doing on the uh, DBT based projects. And similarly in Optimus as well, again, have a CSED pipeline. So whenever we have any code change and it does not meet the specifications of how we need to define jobs or the configurations are incorrect. So every time we do a code commit, automatically the CSED pipeline kicks in and get the error. So these kind of typical practices that we have followed in both the projects have been helpful, you know, using this technology and then, you know, finding out any errors. In your experience of working through these projects, what are some of the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've learned in the process of combining DBT and Optimus or helping companies to establish and iterate on their analytical approaches with these tools? So one, as I said, is of course the version of DBT. So it's important. So one of the limitations that I've seen is that you will have to evaluate the tool, look for what are your needs and ensure that the DBT offers those capabilities. An example that I've given before, right? A start date, like end date kind of example. And that is one limitation. And Optimus as the other plugin that I was talking about. So this is a plugin where, which is a wrapper on Airflow, but is built for Google Cloud Platform. So if you want to use Optimus on a different cloud platform, I mean, we can take the concepts, but we'll have to write the plugins again for that cloud platform. The Optimus is open source and it has been built on Google Cloud Platform. So if you are using a different cloud, then you'll have to kind of like extend it and put in some effort to write the plugins. That is one limitation I would say. It's open source. If you're on Google Cloud, you can use it. But if you're not, then you'll have to extend the plugins. And DBT, as I said, is an evolving tool. Like more and more features, more and more capabilities are being added. You know, before using it, we have to, you know, take it with a word of caution. For people who are starting to, I guess, iterate on their overall analytical approach, whether they have an existing sort of data workflow or if they're trying to build something from scratch, what are the cases where Optimus and or DBT are the wrong choice? DBT is wrong choice if you're not using SQL. And DBT works for some of the popular data warehousing tools like Snowflake, Redshift, Google Cloud Platform, and a few others. If you are using a non-popular warehousing tool, then DBT may not support it. So it becomes a wrong choice if if you're not with the popular data warehousing tools and not using it as well. Also, if you are using a different technology stack for your ETL pipelines for building your enterprise lake. Like for example, if you're on AWS and you're using Glue to process it data from S3 and write to S3 and expose the data through Athena, again, changing your tech stack to use tools like Redshift and use DBT could be a huge step. It again depends at what stage of your journey you're in on your cloud in your data platform. If you're in early stage, you can. It depends on the type of data also that you're dealing with. Typically for structured and semi-structured data, we can load it into the warehouse and then use SQL. So DBT can be used. But if you have more unstructured data, then of course we won't be able to use this technology. In terms of your kind of predictions or forward-looking assessment for the evolving target of what constitutes best practices for analytics projects, I'm wondering what you see as some of the, I guess, influences that might impact change or some of the ways that the kind of evolving set of best practices is going to continue to change or shift in the near to medium term? A few years ago, I have seen a lot more technology options, tools to process big data as we are seeing with the warehousing tools becoming more performant and capable. Tools like DBT and Optimus have come in and they're making it easy to write an SQL and easily productionize it very quickly. With this kind of technology becoming more and more predominant, best practice expectations like traceability is one thing that will become common practice because everything is in tables. We are using SQL. It's easy 
to kind of like capture the lineage using tools like Informatica and others. A few years ago, we had a more technology options. So traceability was a bit of a challenge, but with everything done in data warehouse using SQL in tables, it's easy to have the lineage and the traceability. So whenever there is any data issue, it is easy to trace back and narrow it down to the origin of the issue and quickly fix it. That is one I see, you know, a best practice becoming more and more common and easy to apply. And data quality is also something that is used and applied in ETL pipelines. This again is becoming more and more a common best practice. And we also recommend all our clients and we also enforce and we also apply data quality issues on the source data that comes in. We initially profile the data and we also set up some rules to monitor the quality. And through the ETL, once we have the process data as well, we also have some data rules that will again check the quality of the data before the data is consumed for any reporting which is used by the business to take decisions and also for any other analytical use case. So again, with tools like this, you know, and you know, data quality is also becoming more and more easy to apply and more common as well, along with data traceability. Are there any other aspects of your work with DBT and Optimus and some of the ways that you're engaging with your clients to help them build out their analytical workflows with those tools that we didn't discuss yet that you'd like to cover before we close out the show? Any other ways we are using DBT and Optimus? So Optimus is a open source tool, but built in one of the organizations that I'm working. There is no widespread adoption of the tool. It's currently being open source, but built for specific automation requirements. DBT is, of course, a more predominant tool and you know, many companies, I believe, I think 1,000 plus companies are using DBT in production. And in terms of other ways, I think I have seen two ways that we have used DBT, one in the mining company that I spoke about, and the other is the investment product that I was talking about, so investors would like to see. So those are the two places that I've seen DBT use, you know, used in a, in a particular way that I spoke about. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with you and follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as the final question, I'd like to get your perspective on what you see as being the biggest gap in the tooling or technology that's available for data management today. The biggest gap is a lot of the technology and the tools that are available today creates a lot of dependency or data engineering. So that takes a lot of time and effort when you have something, some kind of like you know, input that comes in from different teams, data engineer becomes a bottleneck or there is a lot of dependency on data engineering. So with tools like the warehouse tools and the DBT and optimalist tools becoming more and more popular, I see, you know, less dependency on data engineering teams, making a lot more teams more capable and empowered to write SQL code, which is production ready. So that I see as, you know, a trend going forward like more automation tools where it's easy to write code and not just data engineers can productionize solutions, more and more teams can write directly production ready code. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today to join me and share your experiences of working with DBT and Optimus and some of the ways that this combination of tools can be used to more easily and effectively allow analytics engineers and organizations to be able to build out their different data products. So I appreciate all the time and energy that you're putting into that work and in helping to support this new open source utility. So thank you again for that and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to check out our other shows, podcast.init, which covers the Python language, its community, and the innovative ways it is being used, and the Machine Learning Podcast, which helps you go from idea to production with machine learning. Visit the site at dataengineeringpodcast.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at dataengineeringpodcast.com with your story. And to help other people find the show, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends and coworkers.